All right. So, like I mentioned at the start, we do have to thank the Tasmanian State Government for supporting the project right from the beginning, the Wilderness Society. And I want to shout out two amazing new groups in Tasmania, Grant or the Grassroots Action Network Tasmania, who are just doing marvellous things uh, in Tasmania. Like, I'm 40. These, these kids are all like 20s, early 20s and stuff like that, and they're really having a go of it, self-organising, self-perpetuating, and just doing really positive things. Similar is Forestry Watch, which is very much a, fo a forestry uh, dedicated group. Uh, we're just a bunch of friends, basically, that get together and <laughs> do what we can to sort of highlight uh, well, what goes on in the forests of Tasmania. So look those two groups up on Facebook, Grassroots Action Network Tasmania, and Forest You Watch. Um, they do programs all the time. There's events happening all the time at those two groups, uh, and I highly encourage you to get involved. Before we do start, I really do have to ha say a huge thank you to the legendary Brett Mifsud. Without Brett, we wouldn't know about hardly any of these trees. Brett has been flying down on his holidays from, from Victoria to Tasmania for over 25 years just because he loves it, just because he can't help himself. He's just got to get out in those forests and find those trees. And indeed, the most famous trees we have today, all discovered by Brett. So it's Brett's work that really has enabled people like me and uh, Dr. Jen, the tree projects, to really uh, have a foothold in this big tree world. And it's his support uh, and indeed knowledge base that we do tap into here throughout the presentation. So uh, if you do know Brett, you'll just know what I mean. He's an absolute legend. So tonight in the presentation, we're going to be covering sort of what we do at the tree projects. <laughs> we're going to go into a bit of a historical context because there's some things uh, that I'll show you in that section that'll just blow your mind. Unbelievable. Like, I couldn't believe it when I first saw it. We're going to talk about, after that, the Tasmanian Big Tree Register. Then where are the big trees? What are the threats to Tasmania's giant trees? And we're going to talk about sort of more policy sort of stuff, but it is quite interesting for sure. The Sustainable Timber Tasmania Giant Tree Policy and our proposed amendments. Uh, we'll have a chat at the end there about the Big Tree State, which is our new initiative launching later this year. And of course, the fun stuff, the Hobart Recreational Tree Climbing Club. So I just wanted to start out again <laughs> by letting you know that I'm not a scientist, I don't have a PhD, I've never been to university, I'm just literally some bloke that loves trees and I'm out in these forests all the time, I'm climbing these trees all the time, I'm out there exploring these forests. And so much of my information does come obviously from science but a lot of the information comes from personal experience and that is something that is hard, hard won in this day and age. You've got to put a lot of effort to get out in these forests. Talk about effort, how about this one? <laughs> this is me, if you can see it, this is me sticking my head out of a giant sequoia over in California. So uh, Jen and I have had really amazing tree experiences. So this tree just here is in a place called the, the Giant Forest, just near uh, Yosemite National Park and indeed if you look over to the right of the photo, the bottom right you can see Mount Whitney and the, the other parts of the Sierra range and just to the top left there you can see the start of the Yosemite Valley. Tell you what, this tree was like climbing the Everest of trees, not because it was big but because it's like the challenge, that experience and a few people get to climb Mount Everest, you know, you might say it's a lot but even fewer get to climb the giant sequoia. So we were very lucky to join in on a week-long research trip uh, with Dr. Anthony Ambrose and Wendy Baxter. And this is another photo from that trip. Massive shout out to Dr. Sky Land, who's there on the right-hand side. Tell you what, what an absolute whopper. <laughs> we are about 40, 45 meters up this tree and holy smokes, it's still four and a half, five meters wide in diameter. So when, uh, when I say big trees, mate, I mean really big trees. We have trees like that in Tasmania, of course, but this is just something special to climb these trees in the, in the States. 
We've had some great times in the forest around Oregon as well. We did a, a massive tree project up there. We did three giant, we photographed three giant trees up there. And this is a beautiful Douglas fir. Look how covered in moss this tree is. It was such a beautiful climb. Really great view as well, looking from behind where I took that photo from. And of course, Taiwan, again, Dr. Skyland, she's from uh, Taiwan. Um, and we've climbed with her all over the world. Really lucky, to be honest. And oh, Taiwan is this most incredible place where you can have subtropical and tropical forests down by the water. But in the middle of the island, there's these massive 3,000 metre high mountains, like a hundred of them, heaps everywhere. And as you go up in altitude, you move out of that warmer tropical, subtropical environment and then into this band of sort of um, more temperate areas. And that's where you find these massive trees. This tree just here is um, the Three Sisters. There's three trees, trees grouped close to, together there. And holy smokes, look at that view. Massive glacial valleys right behind. But again, I hope Catherine's still watching. <laughs> I put this one in. The Rimu from... New Zealand, of course, and North Island, our very first project. I wish I could go back there and do that same project now with what I know many years later and how much I enjoy tree climbing and how much I enjoy just being in the canopy and exploring it. Because look at this photo, you can see that there is just an absolute abundance of life up there. Epiphytes. Uh, everywhere. Look at that big moss mat that Andrew's grabbing hold of there to pull himself over. Orchids everywhere. Ferns everywhere. Absolutely sensational place. And of course, hey doing, look out to uh, Tasmania. See, we had that giant sequoia photo just before, but check out this, this tree just here. This is a remarkable tree just inside the Tasmanian World Heritage Area. Uh, it was logged right up to the base of the tree. Uh, if I, where I'm taking that photograph of it has all been logged about 15 years ago. Uh, and there's Mead, one of our Hobart Recreational Tree Climbing Club uh, people, on one of her first big tree adventures going up there. Look at the smile on her face. You might not know that in Tasmania we actually have five species of eucalypt that do have been recorded over 90 meters. This tree just here is home tree. Uh, this is the tree that was featured uh, at the end of the film there. And it is the tree that Annie found um, when she was out scouting around a uh, logging coop. So about 100 meters away from this, this tree is where that part of the film where Annie walks out into that clear fell, that's right near this tree. And just her science and her abilities and her, her, her toolkit basically saved this tree and it's the remaining forest that was left behind. So it was really a remarkable bit of work. So big trees that kind of in many places around Tasmania. Um, and the funny thing is, I'll talk more about it later. I won't launch out into too much of a spiel just now. One of the things we do love at the tree projects is going on grand adventures, but also communicating that like with this film, let's just say, but also we do a lot of outreach to other media sources like magazines, news stories around the world on the on online and stuff like that. I think this year, this year alone we've had so much great success, like the cover of Wild Magazine here, a six or seven page uh, photo story about Tassie's giant trees. We've been in the global print in a popular science uh, magazine and that is huge. Uh, done a couple of TV appearances um, and I think one of the best ones, most noteworthy ones, is the Weather Channel in the US sort of coast to coast live. <laughs> uh, I was awake very late at night at like 12.30 or something like that for their eight o'clock. Uh, and it was not the best interview, but it wasn't the worst either. It was really good. Um, yeah, so we've been traveling around the world, climbing giant trees and trying to document them uh, using our very special camera techniques. Um, and we've, you know, we're moving on. We've uh, this is what we sort of was it was our bread and butter, but recently we've sort of branched out more into this filmmaking, advocacy, um, and inspirational sort of stuff, uh, like we've been doing uh, with this film. 
and you want to check something cool out, have a look at this. This is uh, Gandalf staff in Tasmania. There's Dr. Sam Woods down the bottom there. And as we travel up this tree, you can see it's basically a cross section of Tasmania's temperate rainforest. There's the first branch, there's Dr. Jen. As we go further up, you can see Yoav in there. Further up still, where there's Dan now, Dan Haley. And as we get above the fog layer, we get to the summit of the tree. Now, the, the bizarre thing about this tree is that it's 84 meters. So this tree would not be protected under the Sustainable Timber Tasmania giant tree policy. Oh yeah. When we did start taking these portraits, in case you haven't seen them, uh, there's a couple of photographers in America, the states that uh, pioneered the technique, uh, James Balog back in the early 2000s, and then Michael Nichols in 2009 and 2011, I believe, photographed a giant sequoia and a redwood, Californian coastal redwood, uh, using similar techniques with a lot more budget. <laughs> but uh, when I was talking to those guys online and sort of just chatting through and you know, discussing uh, things, whether it was okay for us to use that technique and all the rest of it. Uh, Michael Nichols uh, basically said, you've really got to not just take a photograph of a tree, you really have to like take a photograph of those trees at their best or in the most dramatic weather. And for years and years and years, I really took that on board and dreamt about taking a photograph of a giant tree in the snow. And last winter, I did it. And uh, on the computer just now, I'm currently editing this photo together. It's a massive Eucalyptus obliqua in the Florentine Valley, a really special tree. Can't wait for that one to come out. All right, so let's move on to get into some of that historical context. I'm gonna blow your mind here a bit. Check out this out. Victoria, 1890. 1890, not 1990, 1890. Check out the size of that tree and check out all the people standing around its base. I think it's really important to acknowledge that we've had a lot more giant trees in Australia. Victoria would have had possibly the biggest trees in the world, you know. Look at the size of this thing, it's absolutely massive. Uh, you can also take a look at the forest uh, behind this tree, of course, and just realise that it's all been burnt out and soon to be cleared for, for pastures and farmland. Here's a stunning fact, all right, for those big tree people around the world. Australia's tallest tree was 114.3 metres. That's only a few centimetres shorter than Hyperion, the tallest tree today, like a few centimetres, like 20 centimetres maybe. George Cornthwaite in 1890, okay, in 1880 I measured the, the tallest tree ever measured. He used both an Albany level and a theodolite. <laughs> he both got uh, 370 metres for those. But funnily enough, a year later when they cut the tree down for fence palings, he had a chance to measure it on the ground and measure, measured it to be 375 feet. Okay. Think about that, mate. Like, imagine that tree today. Imagine how much money, how much of a, a tourism economy could be built around that one single tree. Millions and millions, tens of millions of dollars a year in tourism uh, revenue. But it's just a paddock. Here's a, oh, mate, I couldn't believe this when I discovered it. Uh, thanks to Brett Mister for, for sharing it. Nicholas Carre in 1890. Check out this quote. I photographed these trees for prosperity, lest future generations bereft of giant trees doubted they had ever existed. That's a guy in Victoria in 1890. All right. Again, more historical photos for Victoria. Check out this photo. About as bleak as it gets, that forest would have been mag magnificent, but it's just a skeletal remains of one just at the moment. Uh, and if I can draw your attention to the le very left hand side of the screen here, you can see the base of one of the trees over on the very, very left is just this massive fluted base. 
uh, for scale there, you can come forward in the photo a bit over to the path and you can see a dude walking down the road there. That tree must have been massive. Uh, I don't want to say sadly, but it's, it is a reality that most of these giant forests of Victoria now look like this. Uh, we do have forests left in Victoria, but certainly do not have that calibre of forest left in the state. The fact you need to walk away with today, tonight is Victoria has 2% of its old growth forests remaining, and that was before the 2020 fires. It's quite possibly a lot less depending on how you're mapping, uh, <laughs> how you map it, I guess, and how what you define as old growth. Pretty startling facts. And so when we launch off into Tasmania here and start to delve into the numbers uh, about what we have left in Tasmania, I think that you can sort of realize uh, it's a trend that's already played out in many places around the world and Victoria is a prime example. So let's have a look at the Tasmanian Big Tree Register, a little thing that we launched uh, about this time last year, in fact. So it was a, a bit of a COVID lockdown project, sort of had all these data sets of big trees and stuff like that. And so decided to put it all online. And, you know, I, I'm the first to admit that it's probably a very silly idea to have the exact location of basically all the giant trees listed on the internet on interactive maps on our website. Okay, but doing this wasn't a decision that I arrived at lightly at all. And I'll just detail three very sharp experiences that I had in the forest that just sort of made me say that we have to do something <laughs> and just taking photos of them isn't enough. So before we do go into that, of course we have to acknowledge the risks. Oh my God, you cannot deny the fact that there is massive risks involved in doing this. Okay, increased foot traffic, increased disturbance to wild areas, insta-tourism, impact to root systems, damage caused by climbing, destination trees loved to death, and the introduction of disease and pathogens like Phytophthora. So, we all have to acknowledge those risks. But again, these three experiences that led me to just do this. Number one. <laughs> Number one was surveying the southern forests in November 2019 and basically taking a look at all the downed giant trees. This tree here is the Arv giant. The tree you saw in the film, Strong Girl. There's dozens more. Not a unique experience at all to find giant downed trees in southern Tasmania. A couple of days later, we decided to just go for a climb, a fun climb, get out there and enjoy it. And this is a massive Tasmanian blue gum, Eucalyptus globulus. At this particular time in November 2019, the blue gums in Tasmania were flowering so hard. This tree is 90 meters tall and it was just this giant pillar of flowers. It was quite incredible. And while we're up in the tree there, we actually, <laughs> heard like bird calls and I'm pretty good with my birds and I really didn't recognize this one call and I turned around and no joke there were swift parrots feeding on these flowers while we were in the tree and I actually have a little bit of video of Alex uh, who's on the trunk there climbing um, grabbing onto one of the branches with a swift parrot just feeding just a few meters away from him. We counted eight swift parrots on that day without even trying and that's pretty remarkable because they are highly endangered around 300 individuals or 300 breeding pairs left in the wild. So we had this crazy, powerful, stoked, stoked experience. Three, three guys up in this tree just loving nature, feeling the vibe, man. It was such a powerful experience. But from the top of that tree, we could hear chainsaws and trees falling not that far away. And so the next day I actually went down there when walking through the forest, and then I stumbled across several trees just like this, 900 meters away from that blue gum, just 900 meters away from the tallest blue gum in the world, through beautiful forest to walk out into discover this. This log, this giant tree just here, is basically 
oh, it was left as waste. So it didn't even qualify to be taken away. It didn't even get taken away. You can see in, in the photo there where those vertical cuts in it where they tried to break it up, but the log was too big for their machines to break up into pulp wood. So this tree just here, the lower 20 meters that they left behind, the lower 20 meters of that base of the trunk measures in at 180 cubic meters and that is two-thirds of the way to giant tree protection. So the lower 20 meters of that tree is two-thirds of the way to giant tree protection. So there's no doubt in my mind that tree would have qualified for giant tree protection um, but it just got cut down anyway. So looking back at those potential or future risks that we spoke about before, yeah, they're in the future. They're things we can manage, right? They're things that we can sort of mitigate, plan for. But what's happening right now to the giant trees in Tasmania, what's happening right now is that we are losing them without even knowing them. They are already a commercialized commodity and they are undervalued to the point of being left as waste. They are lost economic and social opportunities for a number of businesses and people to enjoy and uh, prosper from. But we don't. And to sort of drive home, someone asked earlier about Centurion, if it was okay to go visit Centurion. I was like, hell yeah. <laughs> uh, there's no uh, rules against going to see Centurion. Uh, and if you look at this map, this is from our website, from our big tree register. You can see the yellow uh, pin there with the white circle around it. That's where Centurion is located. And you might imagine that these giant trees are in these beautiful untouched tracts of forest. They are surrounded by pristine ecosystems. And you know, that's what I want to believe as well. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but when you look at a satellite photo like this one, you can see that just 100 metres away from Centurion, the tallest tree in the Southern Hemisphere, it's a massive clear fell. And that's where Razzle, Razzle was walking as he was uh, uh, in the film just there. All right, you can see more to the left-hand side of that clear fell, it's a very uniform canopy structure, all logged there as well. To the top left of that frame, you can see a very smooth canopy structure, all logged and regrowth there. And to the bottom left, all logged and regrowth. So, I don't want to hurt these trees by encouraging people to go there, but I can tell you right now that people are go already going there and they're taking chainsaws. And so the real equation in my mind for publicizing the giant tree register, it wasn't really an ethical one, it wasn't really an environmental one, it was a an act of sort of desperation, for lack of a better word because the real equation in my mind is chainsaws or footprints. What do we want? What do we want people to be taking into these forests and taking out? Do we want people with chainsaws to go in there and cut the trees down and take the trees out? Or do we want people with footprints to go in there, make a little track, make it a bit muddy maybe, get a few photos and tell their friends about it? We have to choose. So where are Tasmania's giant trees? Well, it's actually pretty easy to find them. So here's Tasmania and there's Hobart down the bottom there, bottom left, bottom right, sorry. Uh, this red zone here is the permanent timber production zone. This is the area in which Sustainable Timber Tasmania operates. This is where they uh, sanction to cut wood from. And there's other areas in Tasmania where logging occurs, like private estates, for example. But this is where the government contractors all work. And you can see there where the location of the trees are. Okay, you can see that there's a pretty big overlap between the giant trees and the permanent timber production zone. So looking a bit closer, you can see Hobart there, we're in the southern part of the state just there now. So there's three main areas, three sort of big name areas that you should really become familiar with because they're sort of the keystone places to find giant trees in Tasmania. We have the Florentine Valley, the Styx Valley and the Southern Forests. These are not long distances away from Hobart. You can go and see a giant tree, 92 meters tall, in about 40 minutes of driving from Hobart. Easy. Not even a full day trip. You can go and see it in the morning, come back, have a nice pie on the way home. Easy. 
to sort of emphasize the the uh, the crossover of the permanent timber production zone and where giant trees are located in Tasmania. This is a map of the Florentine Valley, easily one of the most decimated areas in Tasmania for logging. This valley would have been where we would have giant trees, um, a few now for sure, but we would have had giant trees here in 100 years time, 150 years time. But everything's basically been logged. We have very little left inside the Florentine Valley and we just have this row of trees that are bordering onto the uh, grasslands to the west in the World Heritage Area and into the permanent timber production zone. So there is a definite management issue here. So what are the threats to Tasmania's giant trees? Well, oddly enough, it's the tree age is uh, a threat. Our giant trees in Tasmania are really old. Right. That's pretty obvious when you've got giant trees, you don't get young giant trees. The super large giant trees are in the 500 year old age class. Most of the tallest trees in Tasmania have dead tops. They're in decline. And much of the remaining forest is in a regrowth phase after logging and or fire and is less than 100 years old. So the tall trees, now you've got to listen carefully here. There's a bit of a, uh, a catch in this first sentence that you really have to listen closely to. So of the 23 trees recorded over 90 meters tall since the year 2000, of those 23 trees, one has fallen, one has killed in the 2019 fires, three have lost their tops and are no longer over 90 meters tall, eight have dead tops with living leaves well below 90 meters. Of those with living leaves at the top, at least three have severe structural issues. And take a look at this. Only one of the trees over 90 meters tall in Tasmania is from the younger 220 year old age class. That tree's found in the Florentine Valley. So uh, you really gotta take stock of those numbers. So of the giant trees, of the big fatty trees, okay, and again, you've got to listen carefully to this first sentence to qualify the statement. Of the top 20 trees found since 1987, one has been lost to logging regeneration fire, two lost to bushfire in 2010, 12 lost in the January, February fires of 2019, and two are severely damaged in that same fire. So of the top 20 biggest trees in Tasmania, we only have five left, okay? So there is a range of big trees protected under that 280 uh, cubic meter protection. There's a range of trees in there, but of the top 20, of the biggest 20, only five of those are still alive. Of course, you can't talk about big trees in Tasmania without acknowledging the fact that logging has major effects on the ecosystem, on the trees themselves. Um, there's the direct and there's also the indirect effects. Like the indirect effects, you could say, is the fragmentation of old growth areas. The wind damaged by cutting the forest down and just making the tall trees much more exposed to the wind. The drying out of the forest at the edges, escaped regeneration burns, and of course those direct um, effects, logged trees. Just again there on the right hand side, check that thing out. So here's a great example of those logging effects. This is the Manning Grove in the Florentine Valley. This, this group grove of trees is absolutely magnificent, but you can see all around it, the forest has been flattened in successive logging uh, campaigns and you can see that you know that group of large trees up there is a cluster of trees they're all protecting each other all right but as soon as you cut down and make an edge in that forest then the wind gets in then the edge dries out then you burn that logging coop burn that waste and that impacts 
those trees. And if you take a closer look, maybe the photo is not that great when you look at it closely, but there is a lot of stress in the top, to, tops of those trees. This is one of the only areas where we have that younger age class of 220, 250 year old trees. This is the best example of where we might find tall trees <laughs> in 50 years, 100 years in Tasmania. Alrighty, bushfire is obviously, mate, can't escape bushfire. Um, and I guess that's pretty self-evident. Um, all right, getting to the, the crux of the conversation here right now. So the Sustainable Timber Tasmania Giant Tree Policy. Okay, this is the, this is the bit of paper, this is the policy that affords giant trees in the permanent timber production zone protection. Okay, so there's trees that are in the World Heritage Area, forever protected, and there's a whole lot of trees, the majority of trees, that are inside the permanent timber production zone, and this is the policy that grants the protection. So the trees are protected if they are measured at over 85 metres tall. Okay, if the tree is over 280 cubic metres in wood volume. But the, the kicker is that the tree has to be nominated. Okay, these trees are not automatically protected and there is no consequences for cutting these trees down um, before they have uh, protections. All right, and this is an all too common sight in Tasmania. You'll hear our politicians say that we don't log old growth. We don't log giant trees. But we've seen several examples so far in the presentation and this one right here, that holy smokes, <laughs> you can't lie with a good photo. Look at that, look at the log on the back of that truck. That's probably just one tree completely dismantled on the back of that truck. Absolutely disgusting. This is, uh, was sent in to us um, in November 2020. Uh, a person has a property beside the highway and this truck just happened to break down uh, and they got a photo of it from their paddock. So uh, the evidence is clear. So what is protected under the policy, okay? So in the, in the Sustainable Timber Tasmania register, there is 113 trees listed. Okay, there is 45 trees that qualify for the 280 cubic meter protection. There is 75 trees over 85 meters for that protection. Okay, and if you add those numbers up, 45 and 75, it doesn't equal 113 because some trees actually have both uh, qualifications there. Take a look at this. At least 25 of the trees listed on their register are dead. These are the people who are in charge of taking care of our giant trees. At least 25 of the trees on their list are dead. El Grande, killed by Sustainable Timber Tasmania in 2003, is still listed 18 years after its death. Uh, you don't need to be a genius to sort of see that there is not a lot of work being done uh, with this policy. Here's some great photos of El Grande um, before it died. Big tree legend there from Tasmania, Wally Herman. Uh, this is one of Brett's photos. Check out the base on that tree. That is equivalent to some of those big trees we saw very early on in, in the Victoria, in the historical context section. All right, you can just see all those old people standing around the base of this tree taking that photo. And sadly, just like that photo from Victoria in 1890, this tree was burnt in a forestry regeneration fire. Regeneration fire, more like just burning their waste. It was burnt and it was killed. Okay, it was burnt and killed in 2003. You can even see a news clipping at the top right there where forestry proclaims the tree has survived. Nothing wrong, nothing to see here, it's all good. But on the bottom right, you can sure as heck see that it did not survive. So talk, let's talk about species diversity of trees that are protected under the giant tree policy. Okay, like I said at the beginning, five species of tree recorded over 90 meters tall in Tasmania. Okay, so what's protected in that tall tree class? So there's only three Eucalyptus globulus. There's only one Viminalis, 
only one Delegate Tenses and only one Eucalyptus Obliqua. Okay, the numbers are pretty astounding. All the other trees that are protected, Eucalyptus Regnans. So species diversity for the big trees, that volume class of trees. Check this out, zero globulus, zero viminalis, zero delegatensis, and only four eucalyptus obliqua. So the big tree policy is not accounting for our species diversity of big trees in Tasmania. All right, so here are the key failures of the policy as we see it here at the tree projects. There is no species specific size protections. There is no significant or old tree protections. There is no penalties for logging these trees. There is no mention of giant trees and their protection in the forest practices code. And that's the, the government code by which all logging occurs in Tasmania. <laughs> And you don't have to be a genius to see that there is no future strategy. Where are the giant trees going to be in 200 years time? So proposed, our proposed giant tree policy amendments are pretty simple. Okay. There's two things at the top here. We want to protect the significant and old trees. And by what I mean as significant and old is like those big old crumbly ones, the ones that have lived, lived their life, they've been to the sky and they're starting to crumble and fall apart. They're big and they're gnarly and they're old. But unfortunately, while they might have been more than 85 and more, more than 280 cubic meters, because they're old and they've started to crumble, they're no longer in that range of protection. Okay, that's what I mean by significant and old trees. We want to protect individual species champion, just like home tree, all the way back there in the video. The second biggest of a species doesn't even qualify. And uh, we want to do that. We want to do those two protections there by simply introducing diameter as a third measurement. So we want to introduce the DBH or the diameter at breast height of the tree as a third measurement system for giant tree protections in Tasmania. Okay, and here's the numbers we're sort of proposing. So uh, for Eucalyptus regnans and Eucalyptus obliqua, four meters wide. <laughs> okay, so that's wider than any tree, any eucalypt. Oh no, that's not true. It's wider than any other regnans. It's probably not actually, there's probably one regnans in Victoria that is four meters wide. But <laughs> what I'm trying to get at is four meters wide is a massive tree. It's not two meters, okay? You might have a reasonably think that a tree that was logged 150 years ago could be, two, could be two meters wide. So asking for four meters for protection isn't asking too much. We know we're not gonna protect all the forest with this, right? This is only a small step on the way to ending native forest logging. So Eucalyptus obliqua and Eucalyptus viminalis, Eucalyptus delicate tensus, all at 2.5 meters wide because they sort of grow at higher elevations and have different growing habits than the regnans and obliqua. So we want to also add the giant tree protections into the forest practices code. We want to make it so that every tree with these diameters, with those heights, with that volume, protected no matter what so a logger can't just go and cut them down because they weren't nominated and not on the register it is if a tree is close to these diameters they have to measure it and if it's that big that area is protected okay it's a lot simpler and of course as part of being in the forest practice of code penalties for cutting the trees down so Introducing a diameter or the DBH, di diameter at breast height, as a third measurement, it's not a, just something plucked out of thin air. The trees in Victoria, check this out. Uh, you can see on the definition of a giant tree on the Vic Forests uh, document there, their classification for protection for a giant tree is 2.5 meters wide. So any tree, any tree in the state over 2.5 meters wide, as long as it's in the state forest, is automatically protected. 2.5 meters. It certainly makes our uh, suggestions 
seem very reasonable. And from British Columbia, hey everyone from British Columbia. British Columbia timber sales is like the equivalent of Sustainable Timber Tasmania in British Columbia. They have species specific diameter protections there. And look at those sizes, 2.1 meters, 2.1, 2.2 and 3 meters. Again, us campaigning for 4 meter wide trees to be protected <laughs> is pretty dang reasonable. All right, ladies and gentlemen, whoa, mate, that is some heavy stuff, super heavy stuff, and I really think uh, you've done a great job sticking through that. We're gonna try and finish on, on a high note here, gonna try and finish on some future and current projects that we have here at the, uh, the Tree Projects, and one of them is the Big Tree State, Tasmania, the Big Tree State. So as Yo have talked about in the film there, and as it's come to, uh, my realization is that we can't, well we can, but the government is not going to take the log trucks and the loggers out of these forests without replacing that revenue uh, by something else. And tourism is a way to do that. But unfortunately in Tasmania at the moment there is such little information about our giant trees. There is such little um, availability for anyone that goes to the state to really find these giant trees and sort of plan a trip. How long is it going to take to get there from Hobart? Is it going to take a full day? Is it going to take half a day? I don't know. So the Big Tree State is going to be something, a website that we're going to be launching later in the year that is going to be 100% tourism focused. It's going to feature uh, journeys that will take us take visitors around the Styx Valley, the Florentine Valley and the Southern Forest. It's going to talk about places to stay, other things to see along the way, where you can fill up, where the bloody toilets are, you know, simple things like that that really make planning a journey a lot dang easier. Okay, Big Tree State launching later in the year. Aha, this is my fun stuff, the Hobart Recreational Tree Climbing Club. Oh, mate, if you've never tried tree climbing, you've got to give it a crack. It is super great fun. So, um, last summer we kind of started meeting up in the park and having a climb with a few mates and it really sort of was like, wow, this is pretty cool. Like, we had the sort of skills, we'd done a course in the States about tree climbing facilitation and stuff like that. And we had all this gear and we're like, mate, we've got to get out there and do this. And so uh, as the COVID lockdown ended in Tasmania, oh, we jumped straight up into those trees. And over the last year, we've taken up more than 100 people, 100 first time climbers into a tree for the first time, like using proper techniques, using proper gear um, and in a safe environment that's non-competitive and very, very friendly. So we just want to create like a, a greater appreciation of trees by affording people, the more adventurous people, a new experience and a new way of looking at trees and forests. Okay, so while we do like try and do two free, uh, two free uh, sessions a week in Hobart in a park tree, just like this one here, uh, one of the main goals is actually getting people used to being on rope, getting people used to uh, climbing and being above the ground uh, and then learning the techniques and then once they're comfortable taking them out into the forest and getting them up into a big giant tree in the forest because I'll tell you now some of the greatest most pivotal most meaningful experiences in my adult life have all come at the top of one of these giant trees and I, I believe that it is those experiences that just motivate us here at the Tree Projects to do what we do. Like, we're not here to make money, we're here to do something that's enjoyable for us and good for the world as well. So the Hobart Recreational Tree Climbing Club is just a way of sharing those experiences with new people uh, from around the state and around the country too, if you want to come down and join. All right. So what are our goals with all of this at the Tree Project? What are our goals showing you all this, making these films, doing this climbing, all this sort of stuff? Our basic goal is to inform you and inspire you to get out there and see these trees for yourself. 
because without you going out to these forests and connecting with them, knowing them, understanding them, and being inspired by them, how can we ever expect any change to really happen? We need people to fall in love with these forests and these trees, just like we have. Um, and that is the way in which change can take place. It's not going to be activists out in these forests. It's going to be you and me having a good time. <laughs> well, uh, thanks so much uh, for sticking around. It's really great uh, to have you here. It's really great to share this with you uh, and just let you know what happens here at the Tree Projects, I guess, and down in Tasmania. If anyone wants to ever come to Tasmania, uh, let us know. Take a look at our website. Our big tree register is uh, located on our website at thetreeprojects.com. We're working on an updated uh, Tree Projects website at the moment. They're trying to lay out the information a bit more clearly for you. Um, you can go there right now and just surf around on the maps and just see how all the trees are laid out, where they are, and you get a good idea of, you know, there's a lot of trees out there, all right, but there's a lot of forest that uh, really should have been more giant trees for sure. Um, again, thank you very much. We're going to sort of uh, have a crack at answering a few questions on the comments now. So uh, I'm, I can scroll up a little bit and have a crack, Let's see if there's some up here. Uh, Sandra, definitely journeyed to Tasmania this year, so thank you very much. Planning a journey is difficult. There you go. Answered your questions without even trying. Nice one, Sandra. Nice to have you here. How are you doing, Lisa Fitzgerald? Um, great work, mate. I was seeing you on the comments there. Good to have you here. Things aren't that pretty here in BC either, says Stefan. Well, mate, you don't need to tell us. I think we are sharing. <laughs> Tasmania and British Columbia are sharing those experiences at the moment. Uh, and while um, we can learn as societies from each other, I think it's really the governments and the stuff like that that really need to take note about, you know, the economic possibilities that these trees have standing. And we, we want to protect these trees. We want to save these trees. We want to make sure these trees are around for a very, very long time. But in order to do that, to save them from the chainsaws, perhaps tourism is one of those things that is, uh, for lack of a better analogy, is a necessary evil. So good work there, Stefan. Um, yeah, so Judy, uh, can you add the, the add to the giant tree policy amendments that the trees don't have to be nominated to be protected? Yeah, so that's what, if, if the trees are mentioned in the Forest Practices Code, if those giant trees are mentioned in the code, they will automatically be protected. So uh, it'll be the same as um, a, doing something that's unsafe on a work site, for example. There's pretty heavy documentation about safety uh, on these work sites. Uh, you know, pretty heavy documentation about streamside reserves and how you can log around streams and all that kind of stuff so putting big trees in there it wouldn't be hard work uh, <laughs> theoretically it's going to be real hard work because we're not sort of policy people um, but there's for, a crew from forestry watch is certainly uh, doing a lot of work in that space as well so stay tuned and we'll get back to you on that one uh, go down to the bottom here Ta -da. Thank you for Owen Buck Jones, 2022. Mate, come on down. Fortress Australia will be open by 2022, should be. So we're looking forward to having lots of international visitors down in Tasmania to climb trees. And uh, just be aware if you're coming from the Northern Hemisphere, you do want to be coming down in your winter and our summer. <laughs> it's a common mistake. Alrighty. So uh, I think I'm going to just uh, pull it there, guys. Just going to sort of wrap it up there. I really appreciate your time and all your comments there and all your, your kind words, for sure. It really sort of... Doing this stuff is a lot of work and, like, uh, we don't do it 
for paid work. We do make a little bit of money here and there for sure, but our major goal is just doing the right thing. Uh, and so these comments and these nice words here really sort of uh, fill the heart and uh, keep that inspiration rolling along. So uh, stay tuned. Um, I think from here on out, we're going to try and leave the Big Tree Hunters film up on Facebook now. We'll leave this presentation up and um, so people can just enjoy it. It's been great to have you here. Uh, it's been great to be here in Alice Springs. <laughs> Lovely river red gums behind me just there. Um, and yeah, I really appreciate your time this evening uh, and look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you very much.